Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. I hope you're doing well wherever you are. Uh, it is kind of a mad world out there. Not kind of, it's it's it's, it's mad out there. So uh, I, first of all, I want to try to check in, see how you're doing. Reading has still not been great for me this month uh, with everything going on. There's just a lot of stress and a lot of people commented on my last video uh, to say that they're kind of feeling the same way. So, you know, I, 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 I'm, it, it feels good to me that so many people kind of understood and are in the same place. Hopefully, you're staying mentally healthy uh, if you are social di social, socially distancing, and you should be, um, and staying well, communicating with people as much as possible, and doing what you can do to get by. Um, but let me know how you're doing. Drop it down below. Like I said, I'm doing okay. Um, my husband is home. He's actually downstairs right now. Foster son is asleep. Uh, we're still figuring out what he's supposed to be doing for school, so that's fun. Um, but that's kind of life in a nutshell. I decided I'm going to do, I usually wait until the very end of the month to do my book haul for the month, but I I, I don't think there, <laughs> there's much of a chance that I'm going to be adding anything to this book haul by the end of the month, because, you know, money's tight and can't really go out and do shopping and I don't like Amazon in the first place so I'm not really trying to buy plus I, I, I don't want to flood the system with orders if there's not something I don't really need so I'm going to freeze my book haul for March here uh, this would have been a small book haul if not for the kindness of Steve Donahue who sent me a bunch of books uh, before everything got kind of crazy in the world so let's start with those books the ones that Steve sent me the first one is Deacon King Kong by James McBride. I am really excited for this one. I'm excited for all of the books he sent me, but I'm really looking forward to this one. I read uh, The Good Lord Bird by James McBride and really loved it. So I'm very much looking forward to this one, which is his new book. I have the short story collection he published after The Good Lord Bird, and I haven't gotten around to reading it. So I, ideally, I would hope to get to both of them at some point. But you know how I do with TBRs. They don't work for me. Let's talk about the premise. In September 1969, a fumbling, cranky old church deacon known as Sportcoat shuffles into the plaza of the Cause Houses housing project in South Brooklyn, pulls a 45 from his pocket, and in front of everybody, shoots the project's drug dealer at point-blank range. The reasons for this desperate burst of violence and the consequences that spring from it lie at the heart of Deacon King Kong, James McBride's funny and poignant novel. In Deacon King Kong, McBride brings to vivid life the people affected by the shooting. The victim the African-American and Latino residents who witnessed it, the white neighbors, the local cops assigned to investigate, the members of the Five Ends Baptist Church where Sportcoat was deacon, the neighborhood's Italian mobsters, and Sportcoat himself. As the story deepens, the lives of the characters caught in the tumultuous swirl of the late 1960s New York overlap in unexpected ways. When the truth does emerge, it becomes clear that not all secrets are meant to be hidden, that the best way to love is to face the truth without fear, and that the seeds of understanding lie in hope and compassion. Again, really looking forward to this book. I loved The Good Lord Bird. It was probably, I, think, I think it was my favorite book of the year uh, when it was released. And I really, the first chapter of this book is called Jesus's Cheese. <laughs> so there you go, that's a fun fact. Now, as always in my recent book hauls, I'm going to be reading the first sentence of each of these books. Chapter one, Jesus's Cheese. Deacon Cuffy Lambkin of Five Ends Baptist Church became a walking dead man on a cloudy September afternoon in 1969. That's a good first line, and I'm really looking forward to that. Steve also sent me Laurie Moore's Collected Stories. I have seen this popping up. I've heard so many good things about Laurie Moore. I have never read a story by Laurie Moore, which seems <laughs> really bad. <laughs> it's certainly not good. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to finally getting around to this because, of course, this is collected stories. That come, they come from uh, different collections and books. Um, the blurb on the back is that Laurie Moore is one of the most significant and best-loved writers of her generation. These humorous and poignant tales, originally published in the acclaimed story collections Self-Help, Like Life, Birds of America, and Bark, along with excerpts from her three novels, are delivered in her characteristically knowing wry voice and confirm Moore as a master of the short story. I, I, I'm kind of astonished I haven't gotten around to reading her, so I'm really excited to have time. This is obviously not what the cover looks like. Um, it's an advanced copy. So, I, it, it, since this is a short story, it's a little weird to be reading the first sentence, but we're going to go with it anyway. And let's see. Ooh, there's a lot of stuff in the beginning of this book. A chronology, an introduction. Okay. Agnes of Iowa. 
Her mother had given her the name Agnes, believing that a good-looking woman was even more striking when her name was a homely one. That is a really interesting first sentence. Um, makes me even more excited to get around to reading this. By the way, the introduction is written by Lauren Groff, who wrote Fates and Furies, so that's interesting as well. Really looking forward to this. Thank you, Steve, for Deacon King Kong, for Collected Stories, and thank you for this next one and some of the others as well. It's the Glass Hotel by Emily, Emily St. John Mandel. I read Station Eleven at the beginning of 2019. It was the first book that I read in 2019, and I mostly liked it. I had some problems with it. I thought there were certain... It's one of those stories that has multiple narratives, and I thought some aspects of the narrative worked better than others. And I thought that one of the twists was really obvious. But I, I really enjoyed the book, and this kind of follows the same line of storytelling. So it'll be interesting to see if I respond to it better. Like I said, I did really like Station Eleven, despite some quibbles with it. So I'm looking forward to this as well. An exhilarating tale of colliding worlds, The Glass Hotel takes readers from the wilds of Vancouver Island to the skyscrapers of New York. In the glittering intersections of two seemingly disparate events, a massive Ponzi scheme collapse and the mysterious disappearance of a woman from the deck of a ship at sea, Emily St. John Mandel paints a breathtaking portrait of greed and guilt, love and delusion, and the infinite ways we search for meanings in our lives. I mean... That sounds really interesting. Like I said, I had quibbles with Station Eleven. I fully expect that I will have the same reaction to this one when I get around to reading it. However, I am, am looking forward to it. By the way, I should talk about release dates on these. Um, Deacon King Kong is on sale March 3rd, 2020, so it's on sale now. Lori Moore's Collected Stories, March 12th, 2020, so it is on sale now. And Station Eleven... Coming from Knopf, March 2020. Potentially on sale. I don't see an exact date on it, but potentially on sale now, uh, since we're coming to the end of the month, likely to assume that it would be. Next, another gift from Steve. Later, My Life at the Edge of the World by Paul Lisicki. This is uh, a memoir, and it sounds like a really good one. When Paul Lisicki arrived in Provincetown in the early 1990s, he was leaving behind a history of family trauma to live in a place outside of time, known for its values of inclusion, acceptance, and art. In this idyllic haven, Lisicki searches for love and connection and comes into his own as he finds a sense of belonging. At the same time, the center of this community is consumed by the AIDS crisis, and the very structure of town life is being rewired out of necessity. What might this utopia look like during a time of dystopia? Later dramatizes a spectacular yet ravaged place and a unique era when more fully becoming oneself collided with the realization that ongoingness would, couldn't be taken for granted, and staying alive from moment to moment exacted absolute attention. Following the success of his acclaimed memoir, The Narrow Door, Lisicki fearlessly explores the body, queerness, love, illness, community, and belonging in this masterful, ingenious new book. It sounded really interesting to me when I first heard about it earlier this year as one of the most anticipated releases of the year. Um, it sounded interesting to me when Steve decided to send it, and uh, it sounds even more interesting to me now in light of everything that has happened in the very short amount of time since then. By the way, this is released on March 17th, 2020, so it's out now. Um, it's a slim little volume, so very much looking forward to this. It has a blurb from Garth Greenwell. More about that in a minute. Also, and also a blurb from Rebecca Mackay, who wrote The Great Believers, which was a Pulitzer Prize finalist. The first sentence is, We're out on the driveway, my mother and I, leaning against my little red car. There you have that. Speaking of Garth Greenwell, Steve Donahue sent me Cleanness by Garth Greenwell. I have Garth Greenwell's other book, What Belongs to You, and have not gotten around to reading it, but I've heard really fantastic things here on BookTube. And I've also heard really fantastic things about Cleanness, which is also on sale now. Um, really looking forward to reading What Belongs to You, and really looking forward to reading this as well. And I really love the cover. It's really pretty. Uh, FSG did a great job on that. Here we go. Sofia, Bulgaria, a landlocked city in southern Europe, stirs with hope and impending upheaval. Soviet buildings crumble, wind scatters sand from the far south, and political protesters flood the streets with song. In this atmosphere of disquiet, an American teacher navigates a life transformed by the discovery and loss of love. As he prepares to leave the place he's come to call home, he grapples with the intimate encounters that have marked his years abroad. 
each bearing uncanny reminders of his past. A queer student's confession recalls his own first love. A stranger's seduction devolves into paternal sadism. And a romance with another foreigner opens and heals old wounds. Each echo reveals startling insights about what it means to seek connection with those we love, with the places we inhabit, and with our own fugitive selves. Really sounds interesting. I believe What Belongs to You is also set in Bulgaria, but since I haven't read it, I'm not sure. I, I, I know it's definitely not uh, the UK or uh, the United States. Uh, I think it's Bulgaria. Um, really looking forward to this. Let's do the first sentence, shall we? Chapter one, mentor. We had agreed to meet at the fountain in front of the McDonald's in Slavikov Square. Well, there you go. That is the end of the books that were sent to me by Steve Donahue. Thank you, Steve. I'm really looking forward to reading all of these. Can't wait. Although I haven't been reading a whole lot, so I don't know when I'm going to be getting to any of these. But I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. Um, and then I have three books that I brought into my library myself in the month of March. The first is going to look familiar. The Housekeeper and the Professor by Yoko Ogawa. I had mentioned that I had gotten these uh, vintage Japan books, a couple of them. The only one I don't have now is The Wind-Up Bird Chronicles by Haruki Murakami, because I already own a copy of The Wind-Up Bird Chronicles. I did not grab the other books in the series um, for this. I talked, I talked about all of them in my previous book haul, which I will link down below, uh, and I'm not getting up to go grab them right now. Uh, they're just really pretty editions of these books. I saw them posted on Eric Carl Anderson's Instagram account sometime in the past, and I always remembered them. And since my one of my reading goal for the year is to read outside your comfort zone, and part of that is to read books by authors um, outside of the United States and Europe, all of the vintage Japan books seemed like natural fits for that. And they're just so pretty. Look at this. It's so pretty. And this is a slim little volume. Uh, I've heard so many good things about Yoko Ogawa in the past year, especially since The Memory Police uh, was released, so really looking forward to finally reading a book of hers as well. Let's get to the plot. Because of a head injury 17 years ago, the professor only has an 80-minute memory. Although he may not remember what he had for breakfast, his mind is alive with elegant mathematical equations from the past. He devises clever maths riddles based on the housekeeper's shoe size or her birthday, and the numbers reveal a sheltering and poetic world to both the housekeeper and her 10-year-old son. With each new equation, these three lost souls forge a bond that runs far deeper than memory. And this is translated by Stephen, Stephen Snyder. And I just want to point out, on the inside flap, it, the, the, these books are just so pretty and well put together. I love them. I'm so glad I, I ordered them um, and th that I have this set. First sentence. We call him the professor. And that's it. That's the first sentence. And then we go to my book of the month picks. Uh, first one is Writers and Lovers by Lily King, um, which has a sticker from Read with Jenna, which is a book club I, I confess I don't care anything about, so I wish I could take it off, but it's actually in the cover. Does that bother you guys as much as it bothers me? <laughs> it really, ah, it, it's, and it's funny because if, it if it was any other book club, I'd be fine with it. But for some reason, that one just bothers me. Anyway, I have read a Lily King book before. She published Euphoria a couple of years ago, which was one of the New York Times best books of the year. And I liked it. I thought it was a very good book. I don't know that I would have called it one of the best of the year, but it was really good and I enjoyed it. It was kind of followed, if you're unfamiliar, that one followed a sort of love triangle um, among three anthropologists who were out exploring and uh, kind of just discovering that their goals and intentions might not have been best and might not have prepared them for it. So I'm really looking forward to Writers and Lovers, in which, blindsided by her mother's sudden death and wrecked by a recent love affair, Casey Peabody has arrived in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the summer of 1997 without a plan. Her mail consists of wedding invitations and final notices from debt collectors, a former child golf, golf prodigy. She now waits tables in Harvard Square and rents a tiny moldy room at the side of a garage where she works on the novel she's been writing for six years. At 31, Casey is still clutching onto something nearly all her old friends have let go of, the determination to live a creative life. When she falls for two very different men at the same time, her world fractures even more. Casey's fight to fulfill her ambitions and balance the conflicting demands of art and life is challenged in ways that push her to the brink. 
Writers and Lovers follows Casey in the last days of a long youth, a time when every element of her life comes to crisis. Written with King's trademark humor, heart, and intelligence, Writers and Lovers is a transfixing novel that explores the artistic passion, ambition, and the terrifying and exhilarating leap between the end of one phase of life and the beginning of another. There you go. Interesting that the last one involved a love triangle and this one involves a love triangle. So it's funny how you notice little commonalities in an author's writing. Here we go. First sentence. I have a pact with myself not to think about money in the morning. There you go. And the other book I got from Book, uh, book of the Month Club as an add-on is The Splendid and the Vile by Eric Larson. I have read two books by Eric Larson. Um, the Devil in the White City and the... Oh God, I'm blanking on the name of it. But the one where uh, a father and a daughter are in Germany leading up to World War II. Um, I'm sure the name of it is probably on his about the author. Uh, in the Garden of Beasts. There you have it. Uh, I thought In the Garden of Beasts was mostly a good book, mostly interesting, uh, but I didn't love it. Um, the Devil in the White City, I'd say, is a fascinating book. I don't think the two different narratives that he's telling tie together as well as he thinks they do, but it's really interesting. So I'm kind of hoping from... Uh, as I enjoy his writing. He, he always reveals interesting things about what he covers. Um, so I'm looking forward to trying another one. This is a saga of the Churchill family. Uh, wait, a saga of Churchill, comma, family, and defiance during the Blitz. Getting to the blurb. On Winston, Winston Churchill's first day as Prime Minister, Hitler invaded Holland and Belgium. Poland and Czechoslovakia had already fallen, and the Dunkirk evacuation was just two weeks away. For the next 12 months, Hitler would wage a relentless bombing campaign, killing 45,000 Britons. It was up to Churchill to hold the country together and persuade President Franklin Roosevelt that Britain was a worthy ally and willing to fight to the end. In The Splendid and the Vile, Eric Larson shows in cinematic detail how Churchill taught the British people the art of being fearless. It is a story about political brinksmanship, but it's also an intimate domestic drama set against the backdrop of Churchill's prime ministerial country home, Checker, Checkers, I think? His wartime retreat, Ditchley, where he and his entourage go when the moon is brightest and the bombing threat is highest, and of course, 10 Downing Street in London. Drawing on diaries, original archival documents, and once secret intelligence reports, some released only recently, Larson provides a new lens on London's darkest year through the day-to-day -day experience of Churchill and those closest to him. His wife Clementine, their youngest daughter Mary, who chafes against her parents' wartime protectiveness, their son Randolph, and his beautiful, unhappy wife Pamela, Pamela's illicit lover, and a dashing American emissary, uh, Pamela's illicit lover is a dashing American em emissary. That's what I get for making a face in the middle of a sentence. Uh, pa and the advisors in Churchill's secret circle to whom he turns in the hardest moments. I mean, that sounds really interesting. Again, kind of given event, recent events, sounds a little bit more timely. The concept of fearlessness in the wake of hard times is very, very timely at the moment. So looking forward to this, there is a lovely little photo in the opening of the book. Let's get to the first sentence. Uh, there's a note to readers. Oh, I love a book with a map. I think I've mentioned that before, even though that's a very familiar location. Chapter one, bleak expectations. No one had any doubt that the bombers would come. And there you go. So those are the new books I have brought in, brought in. The new books I have brought into my library in the month of March. Again, thank you to Steve for sending the care package, or what turned out to be a care package, given the way the world turned out. I'm really looking forward to all of these. If you have thoughts about any of these titles, let me know. If you've already read some of the ones that have been released, let me know. Drop that comment down below. And if you disagree about any of the authors that I have read before or any of the books, uh, previous books of theirs that I have mentioned, let me know that as well. And again, really just let me know how you're doing. I hope you're doing well. Let's all hang in there. We will get through this. Um, and I'm looking forward to trying to get back into reading. So hopefully these will all come in handy as I do that. And as always, thank you for, for your time. It is really, really appreciated. Um, I myself have had a hard time follow, not only reading, but following booktube channels at the moment and keeping up on videos. So if you've watched this, thank you. Um, and, uh, you know, I hope you're doing well. And until next time, happy reading.